uh, a few more seconds to see how many people join and then uh, we will begin at, uh, at two minutes past. Um, can I see how many? Oh, yes, oh, very good. Lots of people are joining us. So we just sit here peacefully for a minute or so, and then we will we will begin. I was uh, ordered to tidy up the room behind me, which now looks rather bare as in consequence. <laughs> Up. Very good. So let us begin. <clears throat> For people who've just joined, I'm Anatole Levin, Director of the Eurasia Program at the Quincy Institute. And just a brief introduction of the Quincy Institute. We are uh, a new institute, just set up four, four or five years ago uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, we are dedicated to promoting restraint in US foreign and security policy and in Western policy more widely, uh, promoting cooperation and compromise as far as possible in international affairs and uh, to opposing the pursuit of American primacy by military means. We are also, however, firmly opposed to the use of military force by any country in international affairs to pursue its aims, including naturally to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so, um, oh, just one more thing uh, on the subject of Ukraine. Next Tuesday at the same time, I will be holding a, a book conversation with Dr. Nikolai Petro uh, about his book, The Tragedy uh, of Ukraine. Dr. Petro is one of the, the leading experts on the internal politics of Ukraine. And we will be discussing his book, um, The Divisions Within Ukrainian Society and Possible Paths to Peace. So I hope that as many of you as possible will be able to come at the same time next Tuesday, the 28th as well. Uh, today, however, we are discussing German foreign and security policy. And I don't need to tell you that Germany is, of course, the most uh, important member of the European Union and the most important member of NATO after the United States. And uh, German support uh, has been critical to the unity and firmness of the Western response to the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, and will be critical to uh, any united uh, Western approach to China in future, if such a thing is possible. Uh, to discuss um, German policy and uh, the uh, possible differences and divisions within German society, we have an extremely distinguished panel. Uh, Ambassador Rudiger Ludeking was German representative to the OSCE and served uh, in disarmament. Uh, for the German government. His last position was as ambassador to, to Belgium. Uh, Sevim Dagdelen uh, is a leading member of the left party, Die Linke, the deputy leader of their parliamentary group and uh, spokesperson of, on foreign and security policy of their uh, parliamentary group, and also chair of the German-Turkish parliamentary, parliamentary council. Sorry, I can't quite remember. Uh, and uh, like me, a former journalist happy to say, welcome. And Rachel Rizzo is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, an expert on European security, transatlantic affairs, NATO, who uh, was formerly um, the director of plans at the Truman Center and uh, has written very widely on these subjects for numerous American and European publications. So welcome everybody. Uh, we will, for the first half hour, I, I will be asking some questions and, you know, encouraging discussion among the participants. And then for the second half hour, I will throw it open to questions from you, the audience, which you can uh, send uh, by um, by chat and or, or sorry, Q and A, and I will pass them on. So uh, to begin with, um, I thought I would start by uh, asking uh, Ambassador Ludeking. Uh, as I said, I mean, German support uh, has been critical to the Western response uh, to Ukraine and has uh, surprised a great many people by its firmness and by things which would have been inconceivable previously, including, of course, German arms shipments, uh, including heavy weaponry, now leopard tanks, to Ukraine. But uh, I wanted to ask, um, are there still uh, divisions and differences with it, both within Germany and between uh, Germany 
uh, certain elements of the American establishment and other European countries uh, about the goals of Western support for Ukraine, and in particular, the nature of an eventual peace settlement, if there is one. Or to put it another way, for Germans, what does Ukrainian victory mean? So perhaps I could ask you first, and then uh, Rachel and Sevim could, could also respond. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I should perhaps start with what uh, is, I think, has been a continuous uh, uh, threat in our foreign policy from the very beginning, that our security is based on uh, a functioning transatlantic relationship and also uh, the further pursuit of U European integration. And for these two reasons, I think uh, it's clear or it explains somewhat our position there. Uh, when you look at uh, the pursuit of or the, 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 the pursuit of the policies with regard to the Ukrainian war, I think there has been uh, that that was quite a break in in uh, in our foreign policy, but we still depend on the two pillars that I just mentioned: European integration and uh, a functioning or a good transatlantic relationship. And I, for one, believe that, uh, in particular, the Chancellor is quite keen to maintain uh, the unity of the European Union, but also to keep a close. Uh, or to, to keep the uh, United States involved in the whole issue. And that's why, for example, we had this lengthy debate on the shipment of uh, main battle tanks to Ukraine, where I think Scholz in the end uh, insisted on the United States also bringing their Abrams tanks to the table. But uh, I think apart from that, I believe that Biden and Scholz are certainly on a, on a similar wavelength. They do so, uh, they, they pursue the support of Ukraine uh, in a way which, uh, uh, if at all possible, uh, ensures that Germany or NATO or the United States will not become parties to the conflict itself. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, the overarching um, goal. However, whether that is to be maintained uh, remains to be seen because, of course, uh, in terms of uh, international law, we still remain outside of the war uh, and we just support um, Ukraine in its uh, self-defense. And that's, uh, of course, permitted according to, the, uh, to international law. However, at the same time, there's a strong pressure and I think a one-dimensional debate, I would say, in Germany about the situation. And uh, there's a lot of pressure also on the Chancellor in particular to supply more weapons and to do so more quickly than has been done in the past. Because the weapons that have been supplied, that was a step-by-step -step process and uh, uh, with a lot of, of circumspection uh, that was uh, employed for that. But uh, Sevim, I, I would like to, to ask you, following on from there, uh, when it comes to European unity, it seems quite clear that uh, the governments of Poland and the Baltic states uh, especially have a much more uh, you know, radical view of what Ukrainian victory means than, uh, well, the French government, for example. Uh, and differences have also emerged uh, it seems within the Biden administration, you know, over whether Ukrainian victory means, for example, recovering all the land lost since uh, last February, or whether it means total victory and the reconquest of Crimea and the Eastern Donbass. Uh, is there a serious debate on this within Germany, what the, the goals of Western support are in Ukraine? Well, uh, actually, uh, Anatol, uh, we don't have any political debate. What is the goal in Ukraine? Uh, we are um, delivering weapons. We are we started with helmets, and now we are sending. The German government is sending battle tanks, heavy battle tanks, Leopard two, because uh, there was uh, such a big uh, pressure on the German government. Uh, to send these battle tanks and um, from the United States, and um, and uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, wanted to send them in a coalition 
with uh, some other European countries. And uh, he always also asked uh, the United States to send Abraham tanks. But uh, the problem is, uh, and I already warned in mid-January against giving it uh, in to the US demand for us uh, to supply heavy modern uh, Leopard battle tanks. I pointed out, for example, that the United States was sending Germany directly into the fire line against Russia and wanted to make it increasingly a part, uh, part to the conflict. And uh, now we see exactly that it's happening because there will be no Abram tanks coming from the United States for the time being. And within Europe, uh, only Portugal wants to send three modern uh, Leopard 2 battle tanks to Ukraine. And at the same time, Scholz's decision on tanks has brought the United States closer to its long-term strategic aim of uh, driving a wedge between uh, Germany and uh, Russia. And, uh, and uh, I agree with uh, Ms. Rizzo, uh, who recently wrote about uh, this having ir irreversibly altered German-Russian relations for the time being. So however, in my opinion, this is a disastrous development for European secu security and uh, the German, uh, within the German government, there is no discussion uh, sending, uh, since a year we are sending, almost a year, we are sending uh, um, weapons to Ukraine, but there's no political concept. There is no political goal. There is no strategy. And even though Chancellor Scholz is holding back rhetorically, to some extent, the German government is in effect going along with the United States war aim of uh, backing on the Ukrainian military victory against Russia. So the new German defense minister, Boris Pistorius, confirmed very recently at the Munich Security Conference uh, that he wants um, that uh, Ukraine wins the war. But what does that mean? And I, sh I shared the assessment of the US Joint Chief of Staff Chairman General Mark Milley and the Rand Corporation that this strategy is unrealistic and this strategy is very dangerous because it would mean a protracted war of attrition involving heavy losses and would entail the real risk of the war spreading to encompass even a nuclear escalation. So, and, and therefore I think it's very much the time for start uh, any initiative uh, like the China, Chinese announcement or Brazil's or from the Vatican uh, to start an initiative, a serious initiative to end this war, to end this killing and dying and uh, to try to get a ceasefire and uh, peace negotiations without uh, prior conditions um, on putting an end to this war. Thank you. Rachel, do, do you see uh, any danger of uh, serious splits emerging between the United States and Germany and other European countries over the goals of support for Ukraine? The interesting thing about that question is that I don't know that there is a clear sense amongst not just the transatlantic partners, but in the United States specifically about what victory looks like. Um, I, in the conversations that I've had with people outside of government, those who are maybe more hawkish on the, on the more hawkish side of, of things have definitely been advocating for a total recovery of all Ukrainian territory. Crimea is definitely a part of that. But then when you talk to policymakers, it's much more unclear of what the ultimate war aims might be. I think there is a risk of escalation. There is the desire, the ultimate desire for the Biden administration and the trans transatlantic partners to protect every inch of NATO territory. But it's also to defend Ukraine and to push back against Russia. And so while I, I think that there is a worry about potential escalation, and that's something that we have to be serious about and that we have to be thinking about, what we've seen happen over the last year is the weaponry that we as the United States and Europeans have sent has become increasingly heavy. Uh, I don't think that last March, for instance, we would have been having a serious debate around sending tanks to Ukraine, but we've seen how that uh, debate develops over time. And we haven't seen that risk of escalation really take place. And so 
I don't think that it's it's fair to say that the ultimate aims or the of the United States are to put a wedge in between Germany and Russia. I think Germany is coming to terms with the fact that maybe it's Russia policy for the last 30 years has been misguided. And this Vandal der Kandel, uh change through trade, uh, being highly dependent on Russian energy has been the wrong way to go about things. And you could argue that it's come to that conclusion because it has very quickly weaned itself off Russian energy over the last year. Um, and so I, you know, obviously we have a, have a respectful debate here, but also have to respectfully disagree with that ultimate point. Um, so I, I, I hope that answers your question, but I don't think there's a clear sense of where things are going quite yet, only that this is, it has lasted, I think, much longer than people initially anticipated. And that is, um, I think, uh, thanks to transatlantic support and unity that NATO allies have, have shown. Well, we have a, a, a question from the audience, which I'll introduce later on, on precisely the, the, the background of German policy over the past generation. So we could all return to that because it's clearly a, a, a very, um, a very interesting issue. Um, we also have a question about uh, North Stream, to which we will uh, return when I go over to the audience. Uh, but perhaps uh, now, um, I'd like to go on from uh, Ukraine to an, uh, another issue which has come up in US-German relations, and that is the US move to, I don't quite how to put it, contain China economically, um, and in particular to uh, try to reduce China's access to some of the latest technology, um, which can be used for um, dual purpose for military means as well. Uh, this has caused, I believe, considerable anxiety uh, in sections of German industry and the trades unions in particular, because, of course, uh, quite large sections of German industry are heavily dependent on Chinese markets. So I wanted to ask, uh, perhaps beginning with Sevim, how, how far uh, Germany will be prepared to go along with America on this point? Uh, or whether, because of the potential consequences for you know Germany's economy, whether here you will begin to see some measure of serious pushback. Yeah, um, thanks for this question. Um, before I'm going to repeat this, I just want to add something regarding uh, Rachel Rizzo's uh, statement. Um, I mean, there was uh, we have to be. Um, frank and honest. Uh, so the key for the prosperity in Germany, for the economical prosperity for Germany, was to have cheap energy. And to get energy from Russia, uh, although it's fossil fuels, uh, it was cleaner and is cleaner, the natural gas resource, is, nat uh, is cleaner uh, energy than the dirty fracking gas we are getting now from the United States. And it's way cheaper than uh, also. At the moment, we citizens in Germany, we are paying 10 times more for energy. Our energy prices are 10 times higher than in the United States. So you didn't just imagine what that means, not only for normal citizens that they cannot afford to pay the skyrocketing prices on energy, it's also a problem, a really big damage for the industry in Germany. So we have a really big threat of deindustrialization. So uh, that's, that's just one point uh, why we had this uh, gas cooperation with Russia. And um, I mean, if we just look now in the global uh, a global uh, uh, way, um, everyone is looking for cheap energy. That's not a shame, you know, that's not a shame. So, uh, and there's no, uh, there's no question or discussion getting uh, 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 gas or uh, energy from Saudi Arabia, which is uh, clearly not a democratic country or from Qatar or the Emirates or some other, uh, in other uh, countries of the Middle East. So, uh, I think it was uh, normal for our economical interests, for our national interest to see how can I get uh, the most cheapest and uh, cleanest um, uh, energy for my economy and for my prosperity. 
And the second thing is, it's not just that turn, you know. The problem is, um, in one example, we can see that the term of Zeitemende uh, uh, disregards the fact, for example, that the German government was already participating in the US-led um, policy of, uh, of, uh, of uh, regarding Russia. Just one uh, example I would like to give you, Angela Merkel, the former chancellor in Germany, and the French uh, former president, Francois Hollande, uh, they just recently admitted that uh, they had only concluded the Minsk agreement to gain time for Ukraine to arm itself. So I think it was already an embedded uh, strategy with the US. So it was not a different policy by the German government than uh, 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 in, in compared to the US uh, policy uh, towards uh, uh, Russia. And as I said, um, we have um, already uh, massive problems in the in the German society and in the economy. So we had the biggest uh, loss of incomes uh, in, in the history of the German Federal Republic since 1949. Uh, it's about 4.7%, so about 5% income losses. Uh, so the Institute for Economy, they're saying that in general, it's about 2,000 euro for everybody who lost uh, this income and we have an inflation and we have the problem that uh, that lots of uh, big companies are also um, going abroad to the United States or some other countries to get uh, uh, cheaper energy prices mm -hmm. because of the of the effects of the consequences, the impacts of the sanctions, the economic war against uh, Russia. It's actually an <laughs> economic battle I to as so and when when I come to 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 uh, to China, uh, the problem is you know we have already these economical problems, and China uh, is with a share of almost ten percent Germany's most important trading partner, and not only as a supplier and a source of raw materials, especially for key technologies. So that means breaking ties with China whose rapid progress over recent decades has moreover seen it grow into one of the world's most important drivers of innovation and technology would have disastrous, really disastrous consequences for the German economy and thus for the majority of the population in Germany. And it would be really stupid given the serves, uh, severe effects of sanctions on Germany's economy and industry to now also ruin our trade relations with China and uh, jeopardize millions of jobs uh, in, in, in Germany. And how the discussion in the government is, in German uh, government is, it's divided. So on the one hand side, we have the Greens with the foreign minister of Annalena Baerbock. They want more confrontation. They want decoupling with China. And on the other side, we have Chancellor Scholz and the Social Democratic Party, which are following a more moderate, moderate uh, policy towards China. Thank you. Uh, Rudiger, your views of this? Uh, that's, uh, there are quite a few points that I would like to bring up uh, in response to the points made early on. I would agree, I mean, we don't have any proper uh, strategy um, and there's a big debate about whether we call, we call for a victory of Ukraine or whether uh, Ukraine should not lose the war. I think that's quite... Uh, telling because it shows that there is no unity. And we are also aware about the discussions within the American government. But my sense was that against the backdrop of also the experience made uh, by Mr. Biden uh, during the Cold War, he is quite circumspect and he is aware of the dilemma. We have a dilemma. And that's the problem, I think. On the one hand, we want to make sure that the uh, prohibition of the use of force as enshrined in the UN Charter, which I consider to be perhaps the key uh, provision of a value-based uh, international order, that this is being called into question by the aggression, by the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. At the same time, and that's the opposite side, we need to make sure that um, 
uh, there's no escalation. And uh, I think hardly anybody talks about escalation these days, at least not in Europe. Uh, and I see the risk that there is an escalation once the Russians uh, face uh, a catastrophic military defeat, then they might even go nuclear. And one cannot imagine what would happen then. And sometimes I deplore the fact that possibly many will speak about the war without taking to heart the lessons that we have learned the hard way sometimes during the Cold War. And uh, we should be aware of the escalation things and about this dilemma. And that is, of course, also driving the, uh, the whole issue, I would say. Uh, with regard to the question as to whether the, and that comes back also to this dilemma and to our relationship with Russia, uh, whether we have made a fundamental mistake during the previous years or decades uh, by, and, and there was never this notion of uh, Wandel durch Handel, uh, change through a trade, but there was a broader notion that is uh, uh, change through uh, a rapprochement in a way. And I still believe that this is valid. We have lived quite well for a long time uh, throughout the Cold, year, Cold War years, but also after the Cold War without it. And we will have to discuss the, uh, the, the run-up to the, to the war in Ukraine even more to identify some responsibilities. And I would argue that at least there is a partial responsibility on the part also of NATO, because it, it's uh, pursued in particular with the uh, with George Bush, the younger, taking office, a very aggressive uh, foreign policy, which ignored many of the Russian desires. Uh, whether they are justified or not remains, that's, that's beside the point. But I think we need to be aware of them and uh, be aware of some of the red lines that were drawn and was clear in 2008 already and uh, later on in 2014, that there are red lines with regard to NATO membership uh, of, um, of uh, uh, Georgia and Ukraine. Never mind, I think what we would like to see is not ostracizing, or what I think we would need to ensure is not ostracizing uh, Russia or China. On the contrary, I think it's quite clear that Europe is paying the price economically of the uh, Ukraine war. Uh, I think uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, uh, Douglas has already referred to the issue of, um, uh, of uh, deindustrialization, which uh, is a risk that we should be all aware of. But uh, I think we will be willing to take at least some of the brunt of the whole situation but we need to recover and hopefully reintegrate uh, uh, into, uh, or we need to, to, to be aware that we share also a common objective, at least with the Chinese. And that's why the whole confrontational debate is in my view, very damaging at the moment. Uh, we both don't want to have deglobalization and that's the, the key point why uh, China didn't like the uh, war uh, that uh, Russia brought to Ukraine, because uh, the, the implication was that there would be some sort of debate, and we are having that debate, of deglobalizing uh, the, the, the economic relations. That's not what, what China wants. And I, for one, would argue more in favor of uh, not being too confrontational all the time in the rhetoric. Just to give one example is uh, during the uh, uh, Munich Security Conference, the, um, uh, the Chinese uh, foreign policy uh, guru, Mr. Wang, uh, said that China would bring uh, to the table a peace plan. And he had a discussion with uh, Foreign Minister Sullivan, uh, uh, Blinken, in in. in, uh, in um, in Munich. And what came out of it was the charge or the concern expressed by Mr. Blinken that China would possibly uh, supply weapons to, uh, to Russia. 
something that I think is a valid concern, but there was no effort made to join forces to bring to the table a joint proposal for ending the war. And that I think should be uppermost in our minds because whatever is being discussed, victory, nobody knows what it means. It's cover up, covering up the differences which exist. But I think what we need to make sure of is that all the uh, possibilities of ending the war quickly should be explored. And there, I think the United States was anyhow calling the shots uh, in terms of the Western reaction. Uh, there might be a difference between Poland and Germany, uh, but that, of course, leads us, us also to, to be somewhat vague in our goals. But uh, in the end, it will be the, the United States which calls the shots. And I would think that the United States and China, in particular, if they both were, were to work together, could make an effort to bring an end to the war. Thank you. Rachel, your response. Um, I don't think there's any world that exists in which the United States and China work together to bring a peace plan. Like, I just don't think that the, the relationship between you, the United States and China is at a place where that's something that's even possible. Um, I also don't think we're at a point, you, you made an interesting point where you were talking about the United States sort of being the one that calls the shots. And if you listen to the Biden administration, um, it's interesting because you sort of hear different things. Outwardly, there's this idea that it is not up to the United States. It's very much up to Ukraine. And when they feel like they're at a point where they're ready to, go to negotiate, then that's something that might be on the table. But you also, we also have to understand that like the West is the ones, we are the ones that are supplying weaponry. And so there is some sort of role that we play here. Um, but I do think that as long as Ukraine is making gains, as long as they're taking back territory, we saw a huge counteroffensive happen back in September. We are preparing for a Russian offensive and then a Ukrainian counteroffensive this spring. Um, I'm going to be watching closely what happens with the debate around F-16s. It wouldn't surprise me if it looks very similar to the debate around tanks, where we sort of go around in circles for months and then end up uh, sending F-16s uh, in the same way that we that we sent tanks. But no, I mean, I, I you made some interesting points. I think you know the problem I I, I see with with China. I, I don't think anyone is arguing for decoupling or deglobalization. They are calling for uh, and in, in making sure that both U.S. or European national security isn't under threat by uh, uh, too deep of integration with China. And I do think that's a problem. I think that. We run the risk. Germany runs the risk, um, and I'd be interested in your in your thoughts on this because I'm sure you disagree with me on running into the same problem with China that they ran into with Russia, where you have a certain policy that takes hold over ten or twenty years, and then you find yourself too interdependent. Um, I worry about com uh, companies like Volkswagen. The fact that what is it, forty percent of their exports go to the Chinese market. Um, I worry about China buying up uh, the port of Piraeus in Greece and buying, you know, 24.9% of a terminal in the port of Hamburg. Um, and, and so I, I do think we have to, to look more holistically at not deglobalization, not decoupling, but how our national interest and how our national security could potentially uh, be affected by too deep of integration with China. And you're right, the United States is looking very closely at this with the Inflation Reduction Act, with the CHIPS Act. The IRA is is hasn't gone over very well in, in Europe, obviously, especially in France. Um, and, and so there's a lot there, but I think we're sort of at the beginning of this conversation and the ongoing war in Ukraine and the ongoing you know, geopolitical um, debate around the US and China leaves open room to, to have a conversation about what the what the relationship with uh, Europe and China might look like going forward. Thank you. Well, we have a, a huge number of questions from the audience, so I shall combine some of them. <coughs> uh, well, to take perhaps the, the first one, which also ties into what people have already been saying, um, if Germany was going to pursue close economic relations with Russia, why did Germany not push back more strongly against 
NATO expansion because, of course, in um, 2007, Germany uh, put, a, put a hold on a membership action plan, but it didn't actually veto the, uh, the prospect of membership. Uh, although I know myself from my conversations that many members, at least of the older generation of German uh, politicians and thinkers, were deeply unhappy with this. I interviewed uh, Helmut Schmidt back in the 1990s, who expressed very firm opposition, uh, you know, especially to the idea of expanding NATO into the former Soviet Union. So um, uh, was the, 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 the real problem perhaps um, that Germany, that not so much that Germany pursued um, you know, economic dependence on Russia, uh, but that Germany pursued uh, two ultimately incompatible strategies simultaneously um, because when it should have been clear that the prospect of turning Ukraine into a military ally of the West was uh, always likely to provoke a conflict with Russia, as indeed uh, a number of um, leading American diplomats, including the president of head of the CIA, William Burns, previously warned. Rudiger, is that the key problem? Well, I think you mentioned a key question that needs to be uh, addressed, uh, namely, what kind of line do we pursue in terms of our relationship in this new world order? And we would like to see a world order which is uh, based on common rules and that these rules are respected. And that's why we support uh, uh, Ukraine, because the rules or the fundamental rule uh, has not been respected, namely the rule of uh, no use of force. And uh, I think what I deplore somewhat is that it has become uh, uh, an issue between NATO and uh, uh, and Russia. And uh, I think, well, I mean, coming back to the points made early on, I think, uh, of course, Ukraine can define or must define its own war goals. And they have revised their war goals in a way from March, where they were willing to contemplate a compromise also in terms of the, uh, the Crimea uh, Peninsula. But uh, I think we also need to make sure, and that's why I, I, I believe uh, the United States has a key role to play, uh, to uh, be aware of the, um, of the uh, uh, the approach was, which was defined in the 60s after the uh, uh, missile crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and also during a time when, uh, the, when NATO was in crisis itself, that uh, we need to not only uh, bank on confrontation, uh, but we also need to make sure that uh, we are willing on the basis, and that's also something where we, uh, we have done, we have missed our jobs, uh, namely to ensure that we are, uh, that our defenses are in order and uh, that we not run out of um, uh, ammunition in, in a couple of days. I think in that regard, I think the Zeitenwende was indeed a, a turning point where, from which I had hoped, and unfortunately this hasn't been the case as yet in my view, we should have uh, shaped up a lot uh, by, you know, supplying rapidly uh, new weapons and filling the gaps in our capabilities of the uh, armed forces, not only in Germany, but elsewhere as well. And uh, I would even argue that we would need to come back to, uh, uh, to a uh, compulsory service, not in the armed forces, but the more general one, most probably, which would also uh, allow for uh, making uh, services in other social areas and so forth. But what we are uh, facing now is a multipolar world and uh, we need to be able to, uh, to stand up to that multipolar world. And I'm also not very happy with the debate that we are currently having that it's about uh, uh, confrontation between autocracies and democracies. That doesn't work out. And I think as was done, and I suspected Egon Ba when he uh, shaped the 
the uh, foreign policy of um, or the the basis of of uh, of the policy towards the east uh, in the 60s i suspected he was selling out to the east and he didn't and he was a, 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 a sort of a political realist and uh, a realpolitik was his name of the game and he said uh, at the time that uh, uh, well, democracy and, and human rights do not play any role in international politics. It's about uh, uh, interests of states, and that's what we should pursue. And that's what I sometimes find uh, lacking in a way. And that's why we, uh, we need to shape up as, as well. And that's why we also need to be aware when we talk about victory and so forth. I'm not so sure whether we will be able to, to achieve that. That's why I think despite the different difficulties that we are facing at the moment, we should explore jointly uh, the possibility to uh, achieve some sort of um, end to the war, be it through a ceasefire or through a, an agreement which might in the end uh, mean also some bitter compromise that, that uh, uh, that uh, Ukraine needs to make. But I think there's a lot to be said for avoiding the risks uh, of uh, further escalation, which will come up the further we go into the war. And uh, even those who are uh, taking the standpoint of moral outrage for their views, and I think it was the government which uh, sort of uh, uh, said that the value-based uh, orientation of uh, foreign policy is now what they are pursuing, I think we, we need to make sure that uh, not uh, we're not facing hundred, hundreds of thousands of victims and dead soldiers uh, in the years to come, uh, because I don't see the end of the, uh, the, the, the war as yet, if it pursues as it has been doing in, in the past. I don't know, I, I, I missed your, your question, I'm afraid. <laughs> No, no, it's it's all right. I mean, I just observed myself, uh, which I, I think you know is pretty obvious that uh, German uh, and questions have been about this. The German underspending on defence over the years uh, has certainly, you know, led to very considerable irritation in America and has diminished um, German prestige, shall we say, German influence there. Uh, but perhaps I'd like now to uh, turn to to uh, Sevin. Uh, should if Germany, if there is no initiative from uh, the American government uh, to seek a, a, a peace settlement or at least a ceasefire in uh, in Ukraine, should Germany uh, pursue this itself independently? And is is there any realistic chance of this? Um, thank you. Just let me uh, say something uh, very uh, shortly to the question you asked. Um, I mean, uh, why Germany didn't protest against the NATO expansion, you asked. Well, I think um, Merkel and Hollande, it was Hollande or no, Sarkozy, I think, uh, they uh, vetoed the membership action plan of uh, Georgia and Ukraine in 2008 in uh, Bucharest. Uh, oh no, it was uh, Budapest, um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but George W. Bush, he succeeded in the NATO perspective. And also that time, uh, they didn't have much to decide the so-called old Europeans, you know, and the United States was pushing for a new Europe, for a new Europe against the old Europe, uh, for example, uh, as, a, as a very good, um, good ally for the United States, if you can say that the United States are interested in allies at all, you can say, okay, it's uh, uh, Poland uh, as an ally for uh, new Europe. And it was the old rule of uh, divide uh, of Rumsfeld after the Iraq war. Uh, the, the, the no of the French and the Germans against the Iraq invasion, uh, against the, the breach of international law by the US and the coalition of the willing, the no, divided then for the United States, uh, Europe in old and new Europe. And that was one of the reasons from my perspective. And the thing with the German government, the German government's conduct in relation to the war in Europe 
is symptomatic of Germany's inability to pursue an independent foreign and security policy. So unfortunately, that includes the inability to work towards an end to the war in Ukraine within the framework of a European diplomatic initiative. So that being said, the West and primarily the United States and United Kingdom are not at all interested in a negotiated solution and have already blocked past diplomatic efforts to achieve a ceasefire as the former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett just recently confirmed. And the Turkish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Chavosh Olo, also. And the German government was neither able nor inclined to emancipate itself from the US strategy. Even though Germany is within Europe, the country is suffering the most from the effects of the war and the West economical sanctions against uh, Russia. So I unfortunately consider it unlikely that the German government will launch a diplomatic initiative anytime soon, even though it would be in Germany's own fundamental interest to end this war as quickly as possible. And more difficulty arises from the German government having made Germany a party to the conflict to its extensive military and, I have to say, intelligence support for Ukraine. Germany is a de facto conflict party, especially since Russia sees it as one. And Foreign Minister Baerbock has said herself that the West is at war with Russia. Thus, of course, the German government has disqualified itself from the role of neutral uh, mediator and surveys uh, suggest that the popular majority in Germany wants the West to launch negotiations on bringing the war to an end. Very recently, Allensbach Institute said 62% want a ceasefire and negotiations, uh, negotiations, peace negotiations. So what makes me hopeful is that these people are increasingly making themselves heard. And one example is the recently published manifesto for peace in Germany calling for an end to weapon deliveries and a negotiated solution that has gained more than half a million uh, people in just a few days. And the German government should finally, really finally take the, this democratic wish of the majority of the population in Germany for peace of the majority uh, uh, of the majority seriously this wish and um, and I have to say you know uh, the United States as uh, Rachel Rizzo said uh, that the United States ad uh, administration would say it's up to Ukraine no it's not up to Ukraine just as Naftali Bennett confirmed it was not up to Ukraine and not up to Russia Russia and Ukraine they had this negotiation. And it was almost a finished framework of peace talks on the table, but who blocked it was the United States and uh, United Kingdom. Can I can I just inter intervene mm -hmm. because uh, I'm sorry because uh, uh, Mrs. Daglin uh, really answered your question, which you posed to me: the 2008 uh, compromise. Uh, it also shows, I think, the 2008 compromise, which was struck at the NATO summit in Bucharest with regard to the membership of, of, uh, uh, of um, okay. Ukraine and, and Georgia, I think that was a bad compromise. Of course, by blocking the possibility, and, and the, the Americans pushed very hard on it, and the compromise formulation was only agreed at the very top level, and so some of the collaborators were not involved, and I know some who were not very happy when they saw what was agreed. Of course, the membership action plan for uh, NATO membership of both states, what uh, the Americans wanted to have in the text was uh, prevented, but uh, nevertheless, it contained uh, the invitation for both these countries to join NATO, and that was a red line for Russia. And we knew it, and uh, Merkel knew it, and uh, uh, the French knew it and others knew it. But uh, I think that's one of the things which strikes me that since uh, 2001, uh, some of the uh, basic goals were thrown overboard. 
I remember my first uh, demonstration in the public was in 1968 when uh, you had the uh, Prague Spring. And um, uh, of course, the, the new government in Prague wanted to go to a democratic uh, 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 way and wanted to, uh, to implement democracy, de democracy in their country. But uh, when the uh, Soviets uh, intervened and uh, came with their soldiers, nobody, uh, uh, did intervene from the Western side, because that was clear that, of course, there was a red line. The red line was the Warsaw Pact. Nowadays, that is being questioned. I think, of course, we have in the OSCE agreed on, uh, uh, on a number of uh, uh, basic uh, common goals, but this notwithstanding, I think we need to uh, be aware uh, that Russia still holds the view that it should be treated as a major power, that uh, it is on a par with the United States. And that's why, for example, I, for one, don't think that a German peace initiative will bring bear fruit. I think that's why I would think that it would be for the US to push also uh, the Ukrainians to, a, uh, to the negotiating table. Uh, and I, for one, also regretted that uh, Mrs. Baerbock uh, talked about uh, the war with Ukraine. Uh, oh, no, the war with, yes. uh, that we are at war with, with Russia. Uh, on the contrary, I, I would think we should say we are not at war with anybody, nor is it a war uh, or th that we are a party to a conflict between the East and the West. No, it's about something which is very fundamental to the international order, namely the prohibition of the use of force, which was violated by Russia. And that's why everybody should be brought on board. And I, for one, had hoped that the Munich Security Conference, which brings uh, together many people also from the South, that's the, the, the developing world, would have been used to that end. But it hasn't, obviously. And so we are now stuck with a situation where the West is... Uh, seemingly uh, uh, in a confrontational mode uh, with not only Russia, but also with China. And that's something wh which worries me because I haven't seen the, uh, the result of, uh, of uh, the, or, or the, the proposed uh, 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 peace plan that uh, China wanted to bring out, I think even today. But for me, it's clear that in the end, it's an autocratic state and they would like to join forces and will not keep uh, Russia in the cold uh, if, uh, and Russia is already now a junior partner only to, to, to China. So I think they will try to maintain their special relationship that they have uh, also agreed to in the statement that was issued on the 4th of February last year before the war, where they described their alliance as something very, very special, which uh, would not be uh, uh, comparable to any other alliance. <laughs> when you say special relationship, speaking as a Brit, my, my, um, I'm inclined to tell the Russians to, to be very careful about special relationships. It could get you into awful trouble over the years. But um, Rachel, very briefly, um, because we're heading towards the end, and I have one important question still to ask, uh, but um, should should the United States push for, for, for a peace settlement in Ukraine? And do the countries, including Germany, which are heavily supplying Ukraine uh, with weaponry, does that give them the, the right to um, set out their own ideas for peace? Uh, you're muted. You'd think that after two years, I could figure out how to do a Zoom without me being on mute. Um, no, I think the ultimate goal is, is for some sort of peace settlement. And I think Europe has a role to play in that. I think the United States has a role to play in that. I don't think we're there yet. 
Um, I don't think that we are at a point where um, Ukraine is done fighting. I know we've talked a lot in this conversation about, you know, public support in Germany for a peace settlement, public support in the United States. How about public support in Ukraine? Where is Ukraine in this? How how um, prepared are they to continue on? And I think that right now, if you look at it, there's still a sense that this isn't over. And and so while you're right, uh, Seven, the United States states does play a role here, it doesn't play a role in pushing Ukraine to a settlement that it's not ready for. Um, so I think both things can sort of be true at the same time. But I think when we get to well, I think when we get to a point where um, the the Ukrainians are, are serious about this and the Russians are serious about this, which they aren't, um, I feel like this conversation hasn't really made it clear that like, this is Russia's war. This is not the West's war. This is not the United States' war. This is not Europe's war. Russia invaded its neighbor and it needs to be punished for that 100%. Like that, that is, that is the, that, that that's the end of, end of, at the end of the day, that's, that's what happened. And so the United States is not going to push Ukraine into a settlement that requires it to give up a ton of its territory to its neighbor that invaded it for no reason. Um, going back to one thing that you said, I completely agree that the 2008 uh, decision to eventually let Ukraine and Georgia into NATO was completely flawed. Like, I think that was that was absolutely the, the, the wrong decision that that should not have happened. But I also think if you look at what happened in 2014, the um, what kicked off the the war in Crimea was not about NATO. It was about Ukraine becoming more interdependent with Europe economically and moving away from what uh, Russia thought was its own sphere of influence. So I think there's, I mean, really interesting to debates to be had here, but I think if we lean too much on the debate about like what NATO has played in this, um, I think we lead ourselves down a path that um, we come to the wrong answer about why we are where we are today. Um, so I think obviously there are some interesting points here. I disagree with most of them, to be clear, um, but that's what, you know, that's what panels like this are for. Sure. I think if, if there were question, to... so, sorry, we're, we're all to the end. There's one no, question. No, just there's one question that I have to ask because so many, yeah. so, so many members of the audience have asked it, and that is Seymour Hirsch has, of course, alleged um, that it was the United States that uh, blew up the North Stream pipeline, and certainly there seems to be there seems to be no motive for Russia to have done so. Uh, so, um, and I've been struck by the fact that the. I had expected this to, to set off a very considerable debate within Germany uh, without, you know, taking sides on who did it. At the very least, you know, a serious debate about the in investigation of this. It doesn't seem that anything of the sort is taking place. Why not, Seven? Well, <laughs> you, you are uh, your question is the right question because it is uh, shocking how little attention the German media uh, are paying to the revelations of respected U.S. investigative journalist uh, Seymour Hirsch. And uh, you have to get your head around this. I mean, we are talking about a terrorist attack on Germany's and Europe's energy sovereignty that was apparently carried out by the United States and Norway, our so-called allies within the NATO. And it ought to have triggered an enormous outcry, but instead of taking the revelations as grounds uh, to launch their own investigations and uh, put pressure on the German government to finally get to the bottom of the terrorist attacks, our media are either sweeping them under the carpet or trying to delegitimize them by attacking Seymour Hirsch personally. And it is really absurd that the German media are in large part, evidently not even interested in finding out who was behind these terrorist attacks. And it is absurd to rule out the possibility of US responsibility wholesale and preemptively, not least in the context of President Biden's declaration in February 2022, that he would terminate Nord Stream in the event of a Russian invasion, even against Germany's will. So the oh, sorry, can explanation I, we, I can we're find. We're almost is. at an end, and I, I would like um, I would like Rudiger and Rachel also also to respond. Rudiger, should Germany investigate this much more seriously? 
Absolutely. Yes, we need to do that. But we should also be aware that, uh, and that also pertains to the 2008 uh, compromise, that we are very fixed on the transatlantic relationship. And I think uh, the United States can uh, and should take a responsible attitude towards, uh, you know, guiding uh, the European states. They have the, uh, the, the power to do that. And all the powers that uh, are sometimes called for uh, for Germany to to uh, take up on an initiative for making peace in Ukraine, they will not be serious because I think Germany doesn't have the power. But I, I believe uh, there's a lot of uh, sympathy for and uh, banking on the transla transatlantic relationship as it stands. And uh, I think uh, Biden, who is uh, who has witnessed the Cold War. Is, has been a welcome change to uh, Mr. Trump in that regard. And with regard, to, if I may just answer or respond very quickly to the point made by Rachel Rizzo with regard to punishing Russia. I think, uh, yes, of course, in an in a, in a orderly state, you would like to punish those who are so blatantly disregarding the rules but you need to be sure whether that is possible. And that is why I'm somewhat unhappy with the overall tendency uh, that we entertain and indulge in uh, confrontational rhetoric. Rather, I would hope that uh, Roosevelt's motto should guide us, who has said, uh, speak softly, but carry a big stick. And I think we are too, uh, we're not speaking softly at all. And we're not carrying a big stick. I think we need to shape up also our our defense. And uh, that is something for NATO as a whole to do in the face of what we are facing, possibly even after the end of the war, namely a Cold War 2.0, which will uh, call for much more effort on the part of also the European states uh, to shape up and uh, also militarily and hopefully uh, we will be able to realize what uh, uh, Monsieur Macron has said, namely uh, the strategic autonomy, uh, also militarily. Yes, well, <clears throat> I might reply that'll be the day. I've been hearing about strategic autonomy for a very long time, um, yeah. but uh, we, we live in hope. I'm so sorry, we've come to an e the end of our time. We could talk about these issues for days, I think we will probably be talking about them for years, decades. But thank you all so much for a, a very interesting discussion. Uh, I still, you know, regard Germany as potentially a very important actor. Um, I, I wouldn't agree that Germany lacks the power, I would say Germany lacks on the whole the will for a whole set of reasons. But anyway, and thanks to the audience for attending. Um, and I'm truly sorry that, uh, that there were uh, there are 59 questions. I obviously couldn't get round to the great majority of them. But thank you all so much. And I do hope to see you all again in, in future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, and uh, those of you who can, I hope you'll be able to, to come and listen to Nikolai Petro uh, on the subject of uh, Ukraine next Tuesday. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.